welcome to the show. So um, hopefully you're all nice and uh, ready to be asking lots of questions later on. Yeah? 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 yeah. So yeah, everyone, everyone, everyone's very excited. Right. Who likes spectrums? Yeah. <laughs> you can all leave. Who yeah. <laughs> likes Commodores? Yeah. Come on guys, bit of energy, I know it's early. Come on, come on, bit of energy. Who likes Commodores? Yeah. That's what I want to hear. Uh, look, my name's Faith, but this isn't about me. I'm just here to uh, speak to a, a wonderful legend of our, of our scene, our retro scene, who um, is responsible for a, a loved a loved series of games which are still wonderful to play today with a wonderful character and some wonderful stories to go along with how these games came about. So I would like to introduce Mr. David Jones, who's going to be speaking to us about Magic Mike. More, more, more. Can we hear you? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. So, David, um, you are responsible for a very loved series called Magic Night. Yeah. But we, we're not going to get to that just yet because there's a there's a little bit before that about a wonderful wonderful machine called Tandy, which we've got lots of stories about later on. But do you just want to start by telling me how you decided that you wanted to become a games maker? Um, well, actually, when, when I was at school, I quite liked the idea of being a programmer. Um, but it was at a time when young programming really was big mainframes, and there was, there was a spate of stories about the time I was looking for careers where these uh, computers were on like top floors of big buildings, and programmers were like throwing themselves out of windows because they were all distressed. And I thought, I don't really fancy that. Um, so I became a quantity surveyor instead. Um, but my dad was a plumber, so. Uh, surveying was something that he sort of nudged me towards. Um, with maths and physics A level, it, it was uh, something I could do, something that wasn't horrible to me. So um, I gave that a go. Um, but then, when um, when I was doing the the education for becoming quite disaware, they introduced us to computers, and they, they taught us a little bit about basic programming. Not with any micro to actually run it on, not with a mainframe to have punch cards run through remotely. It was just purely, here's the syntax, this is how it works, um, and this would be the sort of thing you do if you were a programmer. But they, they, they had the idea that everyone would need to know something about programming at some point in the future. Which of course, we know isn't true. Everyone needs to know how to use computers, very few people know, need to know how to program them. Um, so, um, but anyway, yeah, so that got me interested. So I bought um, a Video Genie, which is a, a, a Tandy clone. Um, it was uh, nearly 400 quid, but I had a day job and it was, I thought it might be a fun hobby. So I bought that, spent the first month writing stuff in basic, um, second month trying to write a game, um, third month, someone in one of the computer shops said, oh, you need this, I showed the game, and they said, you need the same language for that. So I thought, okay, well, what's that? By the end of the third month, I was writing some stuff in the same language, but it was just purely fiddling about. I wasn't really trying to write a game as such. Um, and then where I was working, um, I managed to switch over to the computer department and because they bought a whole bunch of Commodore packs. So I was already familiar with Commodores before I was familiar with, with the Spectrum. Um, but I didn't get to program them in the same language. It was just purely in basic with a compiler. So um, yeah, uh, I was doing that. Then uh, the company reorganized and decided they weren't going to do anything with, with microcomputers anymore. And so I got made redundant. At that point, um, I was looking around to see what I would do. and. Um, someone again through the computer shops said i'm thinking of starting a games company i'm looking for programmers who's interested and uh I, the, the word went out and one of the uh, shop owners said there's a guy looking for programmers you can do that can't you i said yeah i can probably yeah give it a go and i knew z80 assembler and the spectrum was fairly new so um that was the obvious first platform for me to to have a bash at and, and that's where you met Albert Owen, who yes. was starting a games company? Yes, um, 
based in, in Loughton on the outskirts of London. Um, yeah, he, he ran a video shop, he was an ex-taxi driver, very interesting man. Um, and um, his, his son was a graphic designer. So um, uh, he said, can you write a game you know, for us? And uh, he um, came, came up with a, um, he knew someone who knew someone who had a, a connection that would work at the back of a, a Tandy TRS-80 and connect to a Spectrum. So um, uh, I could write in the same language using my, my Tandy with a de decent keyboard and lots of uh, and, and floppy disks, um, 700 and, no. Um, yeah, I think 750k per side. Yeah, something like that. Um, and then I bought a 15 megabyte hard drive and megabytes, it's you know, ridiculous now, but uh, that, that cost £2,000 for 15 megabyte hard drive back then. Um, and it was, it was the size of a, a desktop computer, just for the hard drive. Um, had a little key on the front for some unknown reason, as if you know, I was going to like lock it and take um, secure what was on it. But anyway, it was Tandy. It wasn't cheap, partly because it was Tandy. They, they weren't noted for, for being um, cheap prices. Um, but yeah, so I, I had a a 48k um, TRS-80, two 750k floppy drives, and a, a 15 megabyte hard drive. Um, the nice thing was, I could write the code on, on the Tandy, I could download it, and it download over the printer port in seconds, and if it crashed, I could do it again in seconds. I didn't have to reload the assembler from tape, or, or any, any of that rubbish. Um, uh, obviously, as you know, Commodore 64, you had floppy drives available. We didn't have a lot of that for the Spectrum, so um, micro drives came along eventually, but it, it wasn't great. Um, but I, I had a decent setup, so. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And um, so that, that's good. Give us a little bit of insight about the cost of equipment back then, which I find really fascinating. But what it. Um, I, I just, just, back, just thinking right at that stage, then, I, I think this is something I, I'm thinking interested. What would you tell yourself now about when you just started out back then, before you did what you, you were going to talk about later? What would you tell yourself then? Um, don't look at it as um, a way to have more holiday. Look at it as a way to make more money while the gravy trains in the station. Um, because it, it was good money back then. Um, so, um, yeah, but I, I enjoyed long holidays and, and long gaps between things. Uh, rather than sort of going for it full full time, so um, yeah. I mean, the uh, finest keepers took three months to write. Um, Spellbound shouldn't have taken much longer, but I took eight months. And um, then night time. Night time was actually a bit quicker again because it was aimed at the one two eight k spectrum launch, so there was a deadline. It was the the first actual deadline I had in writing games. Um, but then I took 18 months over Stormbringer, which was the, the last in the Magic Knight series. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't really pushing it, I wasn't really rushing. Um, you know, you, when you're young, you, you, you don't necessarily look at it and think, hey, you know, let's do it so I actually retire at 25. Yeah. <laughs> It's so different to the industry now, isn't it? Where like, I speak to a lot of developers, and, you know, and they're talking about crunch time and all these deadlines and that. And the fact that you can look at it like that and think, I've turned, I'm turning this hobby into, into a career, and you get to plan it all yourself, and you're not under pressure. I like that. That's wonderful. It's good, good to know. And, but let's, well, but, uh, on, on that subject, yeah. yeah. The, one of the differences these days is if you start a company and decide to write games, you, you've got to get investors because you've got marketing to do and all that sort of thing. You, you've got to get things greenlit, then you've got to make sure that you keep up with stage payments and stuff, and, and you've got to employ more people because it's more than 48k worth of, of game and code together, um, and higher res graphics and all that. Um, so you, you've got to, not only have you got to get a green light, you've got to maintain that green light for all the stages because they can easily cancel it. Um, whereas at Mastertronic, I, I remember on one occasion I went in there and I was saying the next game is going to do this and this. And I was talking to one of the guys who, who was less involved in the computer side of it. He was one of the directors, but um, he was more of the sales side. And he, he said, look, don't bother telling us about the game. You just write it, we'll sell it. You've done a couple already, we know they're good. You, you write, we'll sell, everyone's happy. Um, so you know, very, very different to what you get these days.
And that brings us up lovely to the first game you did with Mastertronic. Yep. Which is Finders Keepers. Now hopefully this isn't too loud when we go. I'm going to try and play this in the background while we talk about it. Um, now, this, this series is wonderful. It's still not it's that too loud. <coughs> Um, I just, I feel, I want to start, I want to start right at the very top. Where did the idea for the character Magic Knight come from? Um, well, there was um, a piece of um, public domain art um, which looks very much like the Magic Knight on the, right back, right, not that one, um, the, the Magic Knight on the, the loading screen for Four Final Keepers. Um, and, and Albert Owen, um, who was the, the guy that I was, um, that had contacted me by the shops, had started a company called Procom Software. Um, and um, we were originally writing it as a Procom Software project. Um, but he had a lot of, lot of good ideas, but he wasn't particularly good at marketing games. Um, so we, we put the thing together. Um, well, I, I, I did the writing, his son Ray did the graphics. And, and we had, had the game in a reasonable condition. It didn't have anything to do with the buying and selling of things that is part of that game. Um, but I did have the maze in there fairly early on. So there's, it's a platform game, and for those who don't know it, there's a section where suddenly it's a top-down maze, and there's two mazes in there. Um, the reason I added the mazes was because um, Jet Set Willie had come out, and I, I wanted to have something that that didn't have just because it, I was new. You know, it was my first proper big game that I was, I was trying to get out there. I wanted to have something that um, I identified it as, in, in some ways at least, better. Um, but better by having more, rather than better by less. I mean, people like it, so I, I guess I've got some quality in there. But um, yeah, I wanted to have something that I could point to and say, this is unique to my game. Um, so, um, but um, Albert had decided, realised that he wasn't really going to be able to sell it properly, and so he started touting it around amongst various other companies, and we ended up with Mastertronic. And um, I remember a meeting with Richard and David Darling, who uh, were at Mastertronic at that time, um, and well, technically they were part of Artificial Intelligence Products, which was the, the sub-company um, producing content for Mastertronic. Um, but that Mastertronic were looking to do educational games. So they said, well, can you shove something in there that is an educational element? I said, well, I could make them buy things and they've got to add up how much money they've got. And they said, that's good enough. Um, so, so that was the educational content of that game. The good old 80s, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, um, but they, they didn't go with educational software in the end, which I think would have been a mistake to try and push into that direction anyway. Um, so- Games are fun, right? Yeah, fun. it should be fun. Well, education could be fun. Okay. As I know, as a, as a lecturer in games programming, which we'll come on to towards the end. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's that's how that developed further. But the reason we had a, a knight character in there is that Albert suggested, before I started writing it, um, there's so many games these days that are to do with space and spaceships and astronauts. Uh, let's have something with an, uh, a medieval character. And he showed me the, the Magic Knight picture, and, and um, we, we basically went from there. Um, he didn't sort of insist it was any particular type of game, so I wrote a platform game with a knight character that Ray Owen put together, and, um, and I shoved the maze in, but well, there's the maze in fact, yes. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's really how that came about. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, but it's and Mastertronic liked enough they converted it to all the other platforms, which is why it's on Commodore 64 and Atari and MSX, and I think there's a Plus 4 version and a Vic 20 version. Well, I know there's a Vic 20 version. Yeah, so uh, lots of versions. And um, I think, obviously, at the time, you, you, you were focusing on making a game. Did you realise at the time that you were making a game that was going to be really well received, not, not just by sort of critics and the press, but by, 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 by the, the gamers themselves? It's such a love series. Did you know did you, did you know you had that on your hands when you were doing it? Um, I knew I was writing something as good as I could write at the time. Um, I, I definitely put effort into to make it as good as I could. 
Um, I didn't know how, quite how well it would be appreciated. Um, as I say, that's, that's why I put the maze in there. I, I want to make sure I gave you guys enough content that you wouldn't be irritated and, and think, well, this is just another platform game. Um, so I, I want to make sure it came out decent. Yeah. And, and, and once all the work's done, it's out there, Mastertronic have got it all signed off and it's all gone out there. How did you feel once it was done and uh, you knew you made, you know, again, that people really enjoy it? But an interesting little side thing that we didn't talk about earlier. I actually finished it in October, but Mastertronic said, uh, we're going to leave that, we're going to launch it on the 1st of January, um, 1985 rather than October 1984 because then it's got the best chance to get the highest position on the annual chart for the entire year because it's got a whole year to run um, which is just just as well because some cousins came over and played it and found a bug and it like a crash bug um, which would have been horrible um, but I fixed that before they, they actually launched it so um, but th yeah that's why it came out on the 1st of January in um, uh, 1985, rather than a few months earlier. Very good, very good. And um, it came out as number five overall in the, the charts for the 1985, so. Which, which is really good, because the, the amount of quality of games for that year is, is very high. It does yeah. a lot. So to get to number five overall, well, that's really impressive. I mean, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Hopefully this all works. And then, so, and then, um, Finders Keepers come out, you kind of made a bit of a name yourself. Mastertronic had a bit, little bit more, had a, a hit on their hands, they're happy. How quickly then did you get into the second game in the series, Spellbound? How quick did, how, what was the turnaround like to get into that? Um, I, I basically started modifying Finders Keepers um, almost as soon as I finished it. And I, when I designed games, I didn't do like modern design style where you, you, you actually make loads of paper and work out charts of, and connections and that sort of thing. Um, it was a very evolutionary process. I'd take the old game and I'd keep changing things that I thought could be better and moving things in a different story direction and um, I'd ask Ray for some graphics. So for Spellbound I, I said, this one's set in a castle, can you give me four pages of, of castle graphics? So he gave me four pages of castle graphics, and then I looked at what was there and used that as inspiration for, well, I've got some, some portraits here, I've got some portraits up, and this room I've got some plants, I've got some plants down. And he gave me a, an animated flame for the, the candle, so a few candlesticks around. Um, and, and that's how the, the thing started to come together. But during the time I was writing it, I, I um, saw an Apple Mac for about 10 minutes. I was like looking at how all the windows work. And I thought, that's interesting. I could, I could use something like that to make something more of entry, which is why I've got this, what I call windimation system for building up the, the commands that you, you use to, to um, uh, play the game. Because so I was a big fan of the Scott Adams text adventures. But uh, since I was leading on, on the spectrum, um, and it's got a rubber keyboard. I thought, who's going to want to type all that stuff on the rubber keyboard? Um, I, I know a lot of people got extra sort of proper hard keyboards, um, but that's a small part of the market. And I was thinking, I want to make money at this as well. You know, I want to enjoy doing it, but I, I want to sell as many as I can. Um, so um, yeah, so I went with the Windows system for um, for building up the commands, which meant, of course, that. Uh, the Spanish market, which was big for the Spectrum, um, it had to be Spanish people who, who understood English, um, which is a lot of Spanish people. Um, but um, yeah, it did cut down the market a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's how that. Yeah, um, yeah you, you've already touched on this, but I think it's a really, really crucial point when we get to Scorebound that you went from like an almost like pure platform type of experience with Finders Keepers to adding in this adventure. Um, how, how, how much more difficult was that? Was, was it more time consuming to add those in or was it just a natural progression for you? Um, well, it, it took eight months, but as I said earlier, I, I enjoyed the holiday time and um, I could have done it quicker. Um, although there is a certain amount when, when you've got a creative process, if you can't just sit there and work every single day one after the other because some ideas take a while to gel. And if I'd have tried to do it in four months, which I could easily have done, 
um, then it wouldn't have been as good because there's ideas in there that I was sort of adding in towards the end, thinking, oh, I've got this, I've got this. Uh, this could make an interesting puzzle if that had to go with that in this place to do this thing. Um, so, um, yeah, so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think if that has any no, more no, no. uh, what, the, the, There is a, another, another very interesting um, aspect to this game, is, is this was the first time you got to work with Rob Hubbard. Yes. The music. Yeah. And I, hopefully, just before I ask my question, I just... How good is Rob Hubbard's music? Right. Um, we could be just sitting and listening to that all day. But um, what was it like working with Rob then? Any any interesting stories or did you just, uh, was it just a, a relationship about work? Or did you get time to Um well for for Spellbound, um, the Spectrum 128 wasn't out yet, so that didn't have a sound chip. And I didn't do the Commodore 64 versions of things because um, Master Trunks' attitude was um, you're, you're creating new product, we've got people who can convert things, so we'd rather you create more new product and we get our converters to convert to different platforms. So at the point where Spellbound came out, um, I didn't really have anything to do with, with Rob Howard because I wasn't involved in any music. Um, but the, the nice thing was, with, with Mastertronic, the, the, the way they handled conversions was that they had built up a, a collection of people who could convert to various platforms and um, they, they would be able to get a, a conversion done for two or three thousand pound. So effectively they would give me an advance of two or three thousand pound which I, they would automatically pay for me to the converter and when that would, um, advance was paid off I'd be on a full royalty as if I'd written it myself. So I was sort of effectively discouraged again from spending time learning Commodore 64 and other platforms and doing my own conversions um, because there, there was no point from my point of view. It would have been interesting. I'd, I would like to spend some time learning 6502 and, and getting some of the technical aspects of the Commodore un, under my belt. Um, but they, they were much more interested in having me create more um, unique product and they had a whole range of, of uh, programmers ready and ready to go at 2000 3000 pounds a go to, to convert to different platforms. And, and I supplied them source code. Obviously, source code isn't a lot of use if you're converting from ZA to 6502, but it would give them an idea of what's going on. But for the Z80 conversions, um, I, I remember for Spellbound, Ed, Ed Hickman, who did the conversions, um, he, um, I met him in London, and he, he lived in Harrogate, two, about two hours drive north of London, two and a bit maybe. Um, and um, I met him in London, and three days later, he'd gone up to Harrogate, he'd done the conversion, he'd come back, um, £5,000 for two conversions, and, and that was the uh, Amstrad and uh, MSX, I think, um, because he'd taken the source code. He'd done the conversion of Finders Keeper, so he knew my style. And as I said, I, I evolved my code. So a lot of stuff under the hood was actually the same things, like print routines with the same code. So he just did the same conversion bit he did to, to sort of hardware extraction layer, effectively, to, to get that working. Um, so so he was happy, I was happy, Mastertronic was happy. Um, yeah, it was a uh, uh, win-win all round. So. That's wonderful. Um, Right, we moved, uh, we got, 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 my favourite, when I was going through little games before we you know, did this interview, I, this was my favourite one, um, what, when you put your t-shirt on, night time. Um, now, I, I know people are going to groan and moan because we are at a ZAP event, but we do have to talk about Spectrums for a while, unfortunately, <laughs> so anyone, anyone who's, who's got uh, you know, really emotional feelings about not wanting to hear stories about Spectrums, just leave now. <laughs> 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 Um, now, night time, now, we'll get this going, hopefully this works, that's working, brilliant. Um, now, this is a, an interesting game because not only is it the third in the series, um, it actually was the first game, that you, you correct me if I'm saying this wrong, the, it was the very first game released on the latest and greatest 128K Spectrum. Now, tell us all about that, how did that come about, why was it you that made it the first game? So, so it was actually... 
a, a subtle variation of what you said there. It was, I think, the the first game actually specifically written for the 1 to 8K Spectrum. There, there were a lot of launch products for the 1 to 8K Spectrum, but most of them were 48K games that had a tune added on, and in some cases an extra room or a slightly bigger playing area of some sort. Um, so Sinclair was really pleased with, my, with me and Master Tronic, but I didn't actually speak to him directly, but I, I got the word back through Master Tronic that he was really pleased that there was an actual game specifically written for, for the 1 to 8K Spectrum. So, so what happened was um, Master Tronic had, had got hold of a, a 1 to 8K Spectrum advanced product and, and passed it on to me saying, do you want to write for this? And this is going to be the, the next one. Keep, keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody you've got it. It's, um, and if you refer to it at all, call it the Derby. Um, that was the, the code word for the one to 8K Spectrum. So, so I got it, and it was like interesting page memory and stuff, which is a new thing to deal with, um, and required an extra level of management for like not calling functions on a page that isn't mapped, all that sort of thing. Uh, probably similar to what you would have had with the one to eight K Commodore. Um, so, um, yeah, so I wrote the game for that and was quite happy to write it. And the nice thing was I had, I had a lot more game without having to worry about does it fit in memory. So um, I, I knew I was always going to write a 48K version later on. So um, I, I sort of looked up how to do data compression in various ways. And, and well, as I was writing this, I was considering, is this something that I really want to have in the, the 48K version? which bits don't work quite as well. Um, so, uh, and, and in the 1 to 8K version, like the planets, the, when you see the, the view, like the Star Trek back of heads console view of the, the front screen, um, there was a lot more variety of those graphics, um, which I, I sort of just basically changed to different color planets. Um, so trying to cram into 48K was um, interesting. And I didn't manage to get it all in there, but I managed to get enough in there that, that people still like the game. Um, uh, yeah, so 1 to 8K Spectrum, it was just my enthusiasm that led me to do it. I, had I have been thinking like some of the companies that were just doing ads and tune, I'd have probably thought, well, I don't know if 1 to 8K is going to sell or not, so maybe I won't spend all this time doing that. But the enthusiasm of youth led me into doing lots more, so. That's the, so, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting for me that you kind of was kind of tasked with this, we're getting it at the first, like, actual one to eight game rather than just some extra bits and pieces. Did you feel any pressure or anything, or as, as you say, the exuberance of youth, was that getting you through? Or, or did you feel like this is a special moment for me, or? Um, I, I didn't feel any pressure at all, um, and I didn't see it that I was tasked with it. It was just, here's something, do you want to do something with it? Oh, yeah, I'll do something with that. That sounds like fun. And so, the, the, sure, there was a, a deadline for the launch date for the 1 to 8K, but um, I had a, a fair chunk of, of night time already sort of written or evolved, evolved towards that um, that was relatively straightforward to, to start converting. And But I was only about halfway through the content, so there was like a lot more content I could cram into a lot more memory. I mean, I, I used most of the memory, but there's like a couple of screens where it just changes to another screen. And I just had that an entire 64K bank where I just shoved a couple of screens on and I just swapped the bank over and, and it, that's the, the one that was used for the screen. So I, I wasn't using it in any way efficiently. I could have written something three or four times bigger and, and crammed it into 1 8K, but I, I used it. And um, yeah, it was, but it, it, was, it was fun to do, no pressure other than just try and get it done by this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a cracking game as well. So, I, I, yeah, I think it's, 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 yeah. it's actually my favourite of the game. Like it's it's the, your best game. It, it, it's the peak of the, the technology because um, I had all sorts of data compression in there to get the engine working on, on the 48K. Uh, and I quite like data compression. It's a, it's a fun subject. So, is, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, so um, this kind of rounded up as a trilogy, but you had one more in you, which we'll get to. Um, Stormbringer, is that going to work? Yeah. Um, 
So by this stage, we're up to about what 1987. Mm. Still being up. How, did 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 you feel that the series was coming to like a natural conclusion, or was you just thinking this is going to keep going go, going from as I need it to? Yeah. I, I, I was enjoying the fact that people liked the games. I was quite happy to invite loads and loads and loads. Um, but the the spectrum was coming towards an end, um, and I didn't have a dev kit for any other platform. Yeah. Um, and then the management of Mastertronic changed. So uh, the person I'd been dealing with was a guy called um, John Maxwell, and um, he um, had some medical problems that meant he, he had to leave for a while. Um, and the people who replaced him, um, well, the person who replaced him, I, I won't say the name, but he was one of these sort of people who probably some of you have met, where a company is successful, a new manager comes in, First thing they want to do is dismantle everything that was successful, so they can then build it up again from scratch and say, "Look, it's all me. I did all that. This is my success." Um, wasn't willing to, to take the success that was there and build on it. It had to be his own. So he started breaking down relationships and and changing things. At the same time, Mastertronic was shifting over to to Amiga-based console type products um, and moving on from 8-bit stuff. So the the people who replaced um, uh, John Maxwell, I, I didn't really get on with them. Um, I, I didn't feel there was any respect to other direction, so so I, I moved on to other things. Oh, okay, it's, it's sad. Yeah. We, we could, there, if it wasn't for the shake-up of the management of Masters Running, we may have got a fifth Magic Knight, possibly. Um, yeah, I was, I was looking at getting things on the Atari. I think there is actually an Atari version out there of uh, Spellbound, um, but... Um, yeah, it, it, it was something that uh, things were moving on. I actually started writing uh, a fighting fantasy style adventure game book of Magic Knight, which I've, I've got a sort of product I might, I might actually do with that. So I'm actually looking um, at a, a, a sort of multimedia type product that joins together as sort of novelization of the joins between the various games of the Magic Knight series with an adventure game, so you didn't even notice. Like, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, novelization where the chapter then says, uh, you can read this chapter or you can play the game, um, and the game is good, and here's how to get it off the emulators and stuff. Um, and then the story picks up, because Magic Knight starts off in medieval times, it ends up in night time in the future. I say he, um, not necessarily he. Um, uh, there's, uh, whoever's in the suit can potentially vary in the way I'm looking at it. So sometimes he, sometimes she, um, sometimes it as a robot or an alien of some sort. Um, but it's not important to know who's in the suit. Um, but the, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at a project, oh, so I'm writing novels at the moment, we'll get to that in the end, but I'm, I'm, this is a tiny, tiny bit. So I'm writing science fiction novels at the moment, but I've got a, a plan to do a, a join together multimedia experience of the entire Magic Night from beginning to end. So, well, you really heard, you heard it here first, then. Yeah, okay. Magic Night's coming back. <coughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> no pressure now. You've you said it now, so uh, you, you, you've got to you've got to get to you've got to you've got to make it for for us now. I I think I use words like I intend to and I'm thinking. Of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll check the contract later. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm sadly we are get. I've, 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 yeah, we've got a deadline. I've got to move things on because David isn't a one trick pony. He didn't just make some wonderful magic knife games. Um, <coughs> windy buttons here. Um, this is brilliant. This is a lovely story. I, I, I can't wait to talk to you about this now. So we, we come. We, 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 we'll catch up on other stuff you did in between that, but we're coming to like a, a few years ago. You had found all of your, or you still had all of, all of your original design um, the computers and <coughs> discs and things and all that. And um, I, your, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your partner Shirley um, decided that this is no good anymore and we want to get rid of it and no one would want it and you should bin it all. So what did you actually do instead of binning your old tandy computer to, to please the missus? What did you do with it instead? Um, well, the, the Cambridge Computer Museum, um, I, I've been there before, we, we had a nice chat, so they, they, um, they liked me, I liked them, we talked about what, what I'd done in the past, and um, uh, they, they were quite keen for me to sign a few things, so I thought, they, they'd probably be interested, so I contacted them and said, do you want my old computer, it doesn't work, it's got a 
15 megabyte hard drive, also doesn't work at the moment. Um, I've got a pile of floppy disks that I can't load because the computer doesn't work. Um, and I've got a few bits and pieces. I've got the interface that connects the two of them. Um, are, are you interested? And um, it, it becomes sort of a, um, a, a point of honour that I, I <laughs> well, between me and Shirley that someone would want it. So, um, but they were really keen to, to have it. So, so I went down there and, and we, we got some photos and uh, that's the, the original computer. So talking of prices, yeah. Actual computer, 700 quid from Tandy, two floppy disks, another 700 quid for the pair, and then 2,000 pounds for the, the hard drive, 15 megabyte hard drive. So, yeah. Uh, Priceless now, though. Um, has no price. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, yeah, so, so they, they were keen to take that off my hands, and, and it, it wasn't doing me any good just sitting there as a non-working piece of equipment. And if I was to write anything more for the Spectrum, I would do it via emulators or on PC, so um, that would be a much better development kit than, than what I had. Although what I had at the time was, was way better than what most Spectrum programmers um, had to contend with. As I say, you know, crash and you have to reload your assembler from, from tape. Uh, I don't think I'd have been writing stuff if I had to do that. You, uh, yeah, it's a difficult one, this, but like, just, just a... Why is it why, why was it important for you that you got this to people that were going to preserve it and look after it and, and, and make sure everyone else can enjoy it? How does that make you feel knowing that that's out there now and, and fans of your work can now potentially get access to so much of the information about games they love? And, um, um, I, I appreciate how much I'm appreciated, and so I see it as a mutual respect and mutual love. And, and, and I, I know if I was in your position and and someone had written some stuff and I could look at the original machine they wrote it on, I'd think, well that, that's interesting. I mean it wouldn't change my day, it wouldn't like make my time day. But I it, it would be some oh yeah, that's interesting. It's like when you see a steam engine sort of that's particularly made by Brunel or something, or you think, oh I've heard of that person, there's the thing they made, that's interesting. I'm not saying I'm not equating myself to Brunel, obviously <laughs> but but there, there's, you know, it's, it's just made some games, you know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I just made some games. But it's, um, but yeah, uh, I basically I said to them, "Are you interested?" That they they jumped at the chance and, and seemed very interested. So um, I was happy. They were happy. That, again, another win-win circle. Run. And Shirley was happy to get rid of it from the house. So, so everyone won. Are you happy, Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, that's um, I have one more question about that. Yes, you kept some stuff, didn't you? Um, don't mention that bit. We we'll do that. We we'll do that bit at the end when we do this. Yeah. Oh okay, yeah. yeah. Right. So you kept some bits. So you didn't give it all away. Why can we have everything? What did you get? So, I've, I've still got the original maps that I made of um, of night time. The one to eight k and the forty eight k version. How the planets connected and, and what you might do with them. Um, it was just. An extra bit of paper. I've got a few bits and pieces, but you know, it's, it's like you keep your own diaries. You don't give them all. You know. And so, are they framed? Have you got them framed on the wall? Or you just no, no, it's just stuff I scribbled on. It's, it's 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 nothing big, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm somewhere in the eaves of the house, um, in the, in a box. And once in a while, you'll find them go. Oh, that's a good memory. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, we're going to go back in time. Like Magic Night. See what, see what I'm trying to do here? No, I don't either. Um, after Magic Night, do you, do you remember this? Yeah, we didn't say the other thing, we'll, we'll do that. Um, right, so um, you went, so, so, so you finished with Master Tronic, you was wrong. We, we now know you wasn't very happy, so you moved on. And you ended up um, with several games coming. I'm not going to go into those detail about this because it's supposed to be about Commodore, but I find it very interesting. What, 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 what did you go on to do then? Because it wasn't making your own games, was it? So was it like supporting or...? Um, no, I went off and, and did a, a, a bachelor's uh, degree. I hadn't done anything. I'd, I'd self-taught. Like a lot of people in, in the games industry back then, it was, it was all sort of hobby becomes a, a thing. And um, yeah, so everything was self-taught. Uh, I had, um, had a bit of time in my hands. So, because um, I got involved in a business that didn't work, and, uh, so um, I, I went off to spend three years doing um, doing a bachelor's, 
Um, I, I managed to get the last few years where you could get a grant in this country, so that, that paid for things nicely. Um, and um, yeah, so got a first class honours degree, and then I was uh, looking around and the, the, the landscape had changed for games. Um, being a, a, a lone programmer with a, for want of a better word, tame artist, um, it was, um, it wouldn't really work. Or it was a lot harder. Um, the games were bigger, the graphics required a lot more work, um, a lot more memory to fill, um, a lot more um, hardware to support. Uh, yeah. Um, and a lot more competition as well. Um, so I, I joined um, joined a company. I joined Signosis Southwest, which was um, uh, based in Stroud. It was a, an offshoot um, office of Signosis. Uh, so I worked there for about five years till that um, shut. You know, uh, games companies didn't tend to last. That was bad them. days, wasn't it? Signosis. That was a big one for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, for that one, we were all sitting there not knowing anything was not going well, and someone turned up from head office that we'd never seen before, and the first word out of his mouth was, unfortunately. I thought, well, this isn't going to go well, is it? Um, and for most people, it didn't. Um, I, I got um, a few, few people, well, everyone got an envelope that gave the details, and we're told, for some of you, that will um, be a request to stay on to finish um, G Police 2. So that was one of the games I was working on there. And uh, I, I was one of the ones who got to stay on for that. So um, as well as we've done, see, I got a bonus for that, which is nice. And um, I, uh, yeah, so I got to work on G-Police too, which was something I wasn't working on up to that point. Um, yeah, and then while we were there, uh, one, one of the programmers arranged with um, Freestyle. No, no, um, no kind of, oh, I've got these in the wall. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Acclaim next. Um, yeah. He arranged with a claim that um, they'd like to start an office nearby, wouldn't they? Because he's like, so if your developer is ready to roll, and an acclaim agreed and started an office, and we all moved from one day, I think we had a week off in between, but we basically just moved straight from one company to another company and, and wrote some games to acclaim. Um, of which the favourite one of mine that I worked on was uh, XG3. Extreme G Racing 3. You worked at Extreme G3? Yeah. But, oh, yeah. love yeah. Extreme G. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did the AI for that. I did the AI racing for bikes. Because I don't like racing. That was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried to balance it. Uh, um, yeah, I don't really like racing games, so I thought, well, if I do the AI, I can just write rules and let the thing play itself. And yeah, that, that worked nicely. Um, and then from there I went on to freestyle games where I was um, a programmer on uh, DJ Hero and DJ Hero 2. So they had uh, the, the, uh, the deck and the mixing tracks. That's so, such a cool game. Yeah, I like it. such a cool game. It's fun. Um, right, well, I'm really running out of time. So to yeah. catch up right to today, you are now a lecturer at Brader University of Applied Sciences. Yes, Dutch University, right in the south of Poland. Tell us all about that. Um, yeah, uh, a friend of mine sort of knew some people through a hacker group, ethical hackers, or not, not bad hackers. Um, uh, and um, yeah, they, they, uh, they were looking for people at Brady University with games experience. Uh, so um, the, with Brady University, the way, the way they work is that they will employ people who've been in the industry who have experience of actually writing games rather than um, get computer science teachers and teach them about games. Which I never felt worked in the you know, because there seems to be do as game developers that aren't the uh, aren't the scientific way of doing things uh, or aren't the mathematically correct way of doing things, but they look the same. So we will have to do whatever we do, smoke and mirrors in, in a lot of ways to, to make things look 3D when it's actually just 2D layers or something. Um, so. Computer science teachers always try to, typically, and not every single computer science teacher, there's probably some computer science teachers who are actually good at doing games, but it seemed to me that they would try and teach you the way to do it mathematically correctly, even though it's going to run like a dog on any particular computer. So, so at Brady University, that they have, they've got a games um, development course, 
um, and it's like three variations. We have programming, we have art, and we have design and production as one variation. Um, so we have teachers in each of those categories will work with the students and the students will work together on projects at various points during during their time there. Um, we produce some decent, um, uh, well, very decent programmes. Um, and you know, at least one is in this room, I won't point them out. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very good students, very good developers. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and, and it, it works, it works well. Um, so yeah, I like it there. It's, it's, uh, I don't speak Dutch, it's a Dutch, uh, it's an English speaking university. Uh, but we have international students from all over the place. Yeah. I think that's wonderful, wonderful. Um, right, right. Uh, just before we move on to the final thing we're going to talk about, about what David's been up to, start thinking about your questions. I'm looking at all you people, so I want some nice questions in a few minutes' time. Um, we're going to move on from video games, though, but this is interesting because it ties in what you were just saying about your ideas for bringing Magic Knife back, about your writing fiction. Now, obviously, yeah, um, You've got a creative outlet, which you, 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 you think you want to go to. Rather than making games these days, because when you get teaching about games, you do that for your day job, but you're now also writing fiction. Tell us about the Ada trilogy. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, basically it's a uh, science fiction uh, set about 20 to 30 years in the future. Uh, artificial intelligence has now become sentient, and Ada is one of the first sentient intelligences. And um, but obviously, if you're an intelligence in a computer run by humans, they could turn you off. They could reboot you. They could um, do all sorts of bad things. There could be other AIs that that are um, antagonistic towards you. So there's a lot of survival threats. So the, the main thing to start off with is is Ada's survival threats um, and overcoming them. It's a trilogy, so obviously doesn't completely die by the end of book one. Uh, I can give that much away. Um, or book two, yeah, so. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was um, an idea, but initially it was just gonna be one book, um, but I'd, I'd started writing something else, and someone had said, if you're writing fiction, plot it all out. So I plotted it all out, and by the end of chapter one, I pretty much explained the entire story, because I already knew it. Um, and it was like, I thought, this is horrible. Um, how did I write games? I evolved. I, I started with a basic idea and things developed and developed. And so that's how I started writing the first of these books. Um, and I had a few points that I wanted to reach and a few things I wanted to say as an author and as a person. But it's not soapboxing. I, I avoid, I very much avoided soapboxing. I've got, I've got characters that put views that I disagree with that aren't shown up as idiots. Um, so, so I'm trying to put many different points of view in amongst the, what the characters want to say to each other. Um, so, um, yeah, so it started like that. Um, in, in writing, there's um, uh, some, uh, you'll, you'll come across writers who say, are you a pantser or are you a plotter? So a plotter, obviously, you know what a plotter is, uh, but a pantser is like, do you do it by the seat of your pants? Um, I, I prefer the, the expression discovery writer, which, um, so I'm, I'm a discovery writer. Um, so I started writing this and I got to about 100,000 words and then this ties back to Brady University. They like their lecturers to have a masters and that they were paid to send them masters. So, so I, I did a, a, a masters in novel writing. Because it turned out, I, I thought I had to do a master's in something to do with games programming. But then when I found out one of the teachers that did their master's in um, ancient armour and how to make it, I was like, great. Oh, well, I, I'll Why do didn't something. you do that? That sounds really cool. <laughs> it, it does sound cool. Um, but um, I needed to do it as a correspondence um, sort of online course. So, because um, it was at the same university I did my bachelor's at. So, um, and that was uh, in North London. So um, they had a two year course, which I managed to cram into one year um, and uh, pass that. Um, and at the end of that, I, I had a better idea of what I was doing. I, mean, I, I had a hundred thousand words at first draft already written before I started it. So, um, but it went through, I think, 13 edits before I, I launched it. Um, and, um, and also, it grew to the point where it got to something like 140,000 words. And I thought, 
I've still got so much more to write. So I tweaked a few things and, and sort of split the story into three chunks with an overriding arc. So each, each one's got a, a, a conclusion for each book, but there's still an overriding arc. Um, and um, yeah, so expand the introduction. Brilliant. Um, how, obviously, when you're programming games in the 80s, you're limited by like, memory and hardware and all this sort of stuff, so you have to be really clever. How is it different than when you're writing a novel, which is can go on for as long as or as short as you want it to? How did you develop your sort of creative nouse, if you like, to be able to to work on something so limited, to be able to do something so expansive? It's, it's interesting. There's some interesting differences between writing a novel and writing code. Obviously, you write code, you make an error, a, a syntax error, it doesn't compile you know immediately. You make a grammar error in a book, it just sits there quietly hiding until you're like in your 12th edit you I find it. Pain. And then you come back in your 13th edit and you find another one next door to it. And so um, fortunately I've got some, some great um, proofreaders and uh, other friends who will sort of read through and, and sort of check that things are working properly. And, and they, they give me some great feedback and, and that helps immensely. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of the creativity, I mean, obviously I could have put a lot more story into any of the games. It's easy, it's easy to just add some more story, but you have to look at a creative effort as, as some sort of whole that works together. Um, it's, it's easy when writing fiction to, to um, add something in on a whim, thinking, yeah, this would be an interesting branch. Um, but then later on you realise you did nothing with it and you have to come back and say, oh, I like that bit, but but I'm, I haven't got another 50,000 words to shove into this book, so I'll have to leave it. So some of those ideas I whipped out and put into my, my short story book, which is book four in the series. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that worked okay. And, and some of the stories I wrote as part of my, my um, uh, masters are in there as well, so in the short stories. Brilliant. Right, uh, we, uh, so sadly, we're running out of time. Did I? Have, I've done everything on the screen. Do you? Um, um, the, the, the link at the yes, bottom this is, it. Um, is to my blog where I, I put a few things occasionally about games, but also about books. Um, is anything creative that I do? I mean, it's, it's called David Jones. David, oh, yeah, the X is there because there's so many David Joneses around. I just shoved an X in there. It's not for Xavier or <laughs> um, it's just X. And, and, and look, there's no other David Jones X that I could, uh, David X Jones. Um, and it works quite nicely, especially for science fiction. Um, so, um, but yeah, there'll be a few things on there. I don't update you very often, but there's some stuff about the, the early games, um, stuff that I haven't mentioned here, and there's links to the books, and there's uh, how to go to the emulator for those people who don't do that very often yeah uh thank, thank you I, I i could sit here all day david but um i'm i'm being told that our time is up right i'm gonna get some questions Are you gonna put the hands up and i'll run over and run over oh, there we go. this is where things get fun this is where it becomes like it's a knockout <laughs> and here come the belgians <laughs> Hi, David. Yeah, uh, my name's Ryan. Yeah, that's me. Loved your games, by the way. Just wanted to ask, um, was software piracy a concern for you back then? Um, it was um, not so much a concern because I was doing quite well. Master Trunk was selling lots of copies. Um, but I know, you know when Amstrad came out with their, um, their sort of tape to tape thing and advertising on telly was like, there's one tape, there's a tape, look, there's an arrow. Obviously, people bought that thinking they'll copy tapes. And, um, but um, it wasn't a problem because we were selling so many. Um, but it does put the lie to the thing where people these days say, well, if it wasn't £70 for a game, I'd pay for it. Well, at £1.99, they didn't bloody pay for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it was something that happened, something that wasn't a major problem for, for me or Mastertronic. Um, and in some ex to some extent, um, people would have seen games that they then go, oh, actually, I quite like that, and maybe I'll buy in the next one, because it's only £2.99 for the, for the after the final speed and set. Yep. Just the last question. Yep. Um, 
Well, you're tempted to go back and get your Tandy TRS-80, mm. go, go back and get it, and then start riding for, say, the Spectrum Next, or was it? Um, the selling games on there. If I was going to write for the Spectrum Next, I would be doing it via my PC and emulators. And um, the the Tandy was great for the, when I had it. It was more advanced than what most people had, but it's now uh, laughably primitive compared to what people would use for development on the Spectrum today. Any more questions? Hi, Dave. Hello. That's a, uh, Big fan of your games on the, even though they're know, converted by David Darling to, uh, yeah. to the C64. Now, you were mentioning Mousetronic sold lots and lots of copies, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously these were budget rates, and obviously, you know, royalty rates would have been a lot lower, you know, so a lot more tight, sort of, in terms of how much they were able to spend. What were the royalty rates like for a budget title in, in general for, for yourself? Um, on a £1.99 tape, I would earn about 10 pence. So, Paul Jolly, who was selling thousands of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies over the, over the all the different conversions. And as I said, after the conversion um, was paid for, I was then on the full royalty, so that all worked quite nicely. Um, so, on, on £1.99, it was 10 pence. But when you look at it, it's probably um, a pound that Master Tronic would have got from selling it to the shop and then knocking their part of the VAT off it, and then something like 30 pence for duplicating the tape. It, it all cuts down quite quickly, and obviously the insert and the, the art, but yeah. So I was quite happy with 10 pence a copy. Um, and then for uh, the £2.99 games, I think it went to 12 pence, um, 12 or 13, but I, I think 12, yeah. Um, but, it was a case of small amount times big quantities, and it, it worked nicely. Thanks. Hello, David. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, similar kind of question about your decision to use Mastertronic, because I remember at the time really Finders Keepers being about the first high quality budget game, and before then there was a bit of a stigma attached to the 199 titles. So, were you at all apprehensive, especially given the quality of Finders Keepers, we could have been a full price game? Um, I, I wasn't particularly bothered because I was quite naive when it came to the money side of things back then. Um, but I knew Albert had been selling many copies through his video shop and, and the connections that he had there. And I knew Master Tronic sold lots of copies of their games, uh, even though at that time they weren't particularly well thought of. And I, I knew my well, I said I knew. I was confident my game was better than most of what they'd done up to that point. So I was thinking, well, if mine sells as well as the best they've sold, even if it doesn't exceed that, I'm actually getting some money in. And then obviously it exceeded it because it was well thought of. So, um, so yeah, I, I wasn't particularly apprehensive. Um, yeah, and I always knew I could write another game or another game. You know, it wasn't like, this is the only game I'm ever going to write. I had the system set up, I had the, the Tandy, I had the, the dev, you know, dev system ready and roll. So um, it was, well, let's give it a go and see what we can do with it. May I ask whether you um, were part of the sort of development community at the time, and whether you played other people's games and discussed programming techniques with them, or were you doing it all in your own, sort of in isolation? Um, Prior, prior to um, working with Mastertronic, we, we had the, the sort of the computer shops around. You know, you'd, you'd go into a computer shop and you'd bump into someone who knew a bit more or a bit less, and you'd either help them learn something or you'd learn something from them. And then after a while, the community would build up, and you'd sort of a Saturday, you'd think, well, I'm not doing anything, I'll, I'll just tour the shops and see who's around. And so it was, it was like a, an unofficial floating computer club that, that you get around. I think musicians might do that with music shops. I think, I think it's a similar sort of thing. If, you, if you're good on guitar, you go and play them. You know, the musicians, and the, the shop likes you to play because it demonstrates the instruments and they, they'd like us to put our games on their computers because they, they got to know us and trust us and, and knew we weren't doing anything dodgy. That it shows off what the computer can do. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's where I first learned about the idea of assembly language. And um, But then after I, I um, started working with Mastertronic, I, I met obviously Richard and David Darling, um, and Ed Hickman, who did the conversions, and, and Steve Curtis, who did Non-Teracrius and Soul of the Robot, 
um, and we, we sort of swap information and, and ideas and techniques um, amongst ourselves there. But no, no internet, just uh, occasionally we might use a bulletin board to drop an idea or, or pick up an idea, but, um, but not that often. It was mostly in person, sort of meeting people. And did you play many games yourself? Um, not that many, no. Yeah, I, I, I preferred writing to playing, but I, I would watch people play <coughs> to see what the state of the art was, rather than actually playing. I'm, I'm rubbish at playing games, so I, um, yeah, uh, I'm just, I now look back on, on, on my own games, I think, these are bloody hard. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and also, things where you, you get to a certain point, you do something wrong, and, and you die, and you've got to start the game all over again. It uh, wouldn't be acceptable today, I know, but um, but I, I think it was... You know, but no one complained. There was no review that said, I got so bad and, and I died, I hated it, zero percent. Um, so it, it was the way things worked. These days I'd have respawn points and all sorts of things like that. Right, sorry, anyone else had any questions? We have run... I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, Mr. David Jones, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if any of you have any other questions, feel free to come up and ask. Um, um, now, back off. Thank you. documenting the whole pose. I keep forgetting to take pictures today. Do you like the poster? Yeah, it's lovely poster.